Thanks so much, Lisa. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I uh, had the privilege of coming to the, I think it was the first research conference for the Roots of Empathy program a couple of years ago, and I've just been very, very impressed, first with the program itself, as well as the rigor of the research that is validating it. And um, it's just one of these things where science and and humanity are coming together in this very inspiring way. So I'm, I'm really very, very pleased to be here and always happy to, um, to continue my involvement with Roots of Empathy. I am a neurobiologist, and uh, I set out to write this book about sex differences and discovered that the science of uh, sex differences just enormously distorted out in the, in the popular literature. So another title for my talk might be uh, sextrapolation in the latest brain science because um, there's just in a, incredible um, distortion of the real science and um, I came up with that title in a Huffington Post that I'll talk about in a second. So this is the story that most people hear about gender and gender differences and this science that has been studying gender for a long time at the behavioral level, but at the brain level for maybe the last 10 to 20 years. And that is this idea that there is such a thing as brain sex, that we really have you know, pink and blue brains, not that that's what it's like under the skull, but uh, uh, functionally. It really all emanates from this mega bestseller, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, this idea that we're so different that we come from fundamentally different planets. Um, and uh, just as an aside, and hopefully this will come up later, but we were talking uh, before we came on about the Roots of Empathy program and the fact that it's equally effective with boys and girls, that boys and girls are equally responsive to the infants in the classroom, which uh, hopefully if you remember nothing else from tonight, you'll take that away. What really troubles me actually is how uh, this uh, brain sex movement has infiltrated our classroom. So there are a lot of teachers that are paying uh, good money to go hear about essentially the same stereotypes from uh, various teacher trainers, neither of them a teacher themselves, Leonard Sachs, Michael Gurian. Sachs has written several books, one of them, uh, his first called Why Gender Matters, uh, where he writes, in girls, emotion is processed by the same area of the brain that processes language. So it's easy for most girls to talk about their emotions. In boys, the brain regions involved in talking are separate from the regions involved in feeling. The hardest question for many boys to answer is, tell me how you feel. So I'm sure at some level, every parent of a boy, this resonates with a little bit. Um, and gee, it makes a lot of sense, and there's research that supports it. But if I told you this study was based on 19 uh, adolescents and that the data weren't even fully statistically significant, and I mean, it's just an enormous extrapolation. And, and so it's a way of peddling stereotypes, trying to give them the validation of science. And I'm going to show you very quickly some, some large very large studies that debunk uh, most of these, these types of claims. Uh, so Sachs is a, a physician. Gurian is, is uh, not a clinician or a researcher, but he really likes the brain and he really likes hormones, so he's written a bunch of books, including uh, Boys and Girls Learn Differently, where he writes that girls have great difficulty learning certain aspects of math because of testosterone. Surgeons of the hormone, which males receive during adolescence between five and seven times a day, can increase spatial skills. Well, <laughs> it, it may, again, it may sound really plausible and explain some of the math gaps and so on, which, by the way, don't actually turn up till college, but um, the fact is, uh, there's not a shred of evidence for this in this case, and yet, it sounds about right, um, and it fuels this notion that Many parents and many teachers, unfortunately, have really bought into this idea that boys and girls are hardwired differently, that they come into the world fundamentally different, and um, you know, it's not anything in their environment. We can't expect uh, them to uh, achieve similar things. Every time there's a study that comes out that describes a sex difference in the brain, it's amazing how much worldwide propaganda it gets. This was a, a study that came out in December um, hit 237 news, different news uh, items on Google News, including LA Times and Reuters and the BBC, and um, claims that the brains of women and men show strong, hardwired differences. 
Um, the actual study that this was based on, it was a nice large research study out of University of Pennsylvania, but it wasn't of men and women, it was of adolescents. It didn't show strong differences, it showed very small statistical differences, and it said nothing about them being hardwired, meaning that they are, these are innately uh, present from birth. So it's just, um, uh, there's just this readiness in the popular culture to uh, presume that um, if we see a sex difference in the brain, it proves that uh, this is all immutable, unchangeable, and uh, we're fighting nature to try to uh, presume equality in, in our different spheres of life. We got to talk numbers because that's part of the problem is people talk about this, you know, brain structure is bigger than that, this circuit is more connected than that, but nobody ever says how much more. And it turns out that yes, there are sex differences in the brain, but they're tend to be quite small and, and, you know, just at a statistical level. And so to understand that, to understand any type of group difference, you have to use a number called an effect size or a D value, which is simply the difference of two means. Uh, here we have a mean of females and males measuring height, okay? Measure 100 females, 100 males, of course. They distribute differently. Men are taller than women. And we calculate this difference, which is the difference of the means divided by the the, the spread of the curve or the standard deviation. And a D value of 2.6 is considered a very large sex difference. And contrast that to most sex differences in behavior, which psychologists have been studying for 50, 60 years, um, that are much more of this magnitude. Um, the difference in, quote, empathy, this is actually one's ability to recognize emotional expression, from photographs, uh, you can detect differences between adult men and women, much, much smaller differences between young children, um, but it's, it's quite small and on the order of uh, a third of a standard deviation. So this has been looked at extensively by Janet Hyde, who's a psychologist at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she had been accumulating all these meta-analyses, that's, that's studies of studies that put all the data together on sex difference and kept finding these very small differences and, and appreciated that it, rather than the gender differences, what we're really looking at is fundamentally the hypothesis, this radical hypothesis that the genders are fundamentally the same. And the data for that come from the fact that out of 124 meta-analyses, so we're talking about millions of, of research subjects here, um, a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, about three quarters or 78 percent of these differences are smaller than what you see on this curve here. So rather than Mars and Venus, a better slogan might be that men are from North Dakota and women are from <laughs> South Dakota. <laughs> I came to this having written one book on brain development and was curious about these gender differences. And uh, so I wrote this book, Pink Brain, Blue Brain, but along the way of thinking I was going to explain why my son liked trucks and my daughter liked ball dolls, uh, I ended up flipping my hypothesis and appreciating that, you know what, there's really a lot more what we call plasticity or malleability there that's, that's then is commonly being um, communicated to parents. And so probably I should have put a little question mark after the title, but instead we put pink and blue and blue and pink, a little psychological test, the Stroop test for those of you who are familiar, to indicate that it's not really um, two different colors when you open up the skull. So here's the take home message. Sex differences in behavior are quite real, but they tend to be much more subtle statistically than the Mars-Venus idea. And every sex difference we look at is a lot smaller in children. And so that tells us that there is, to some degree, a, a role of cultural learning in, in uh, creating the difference between men and women. There really is no such thing as a male brain or female brain. I teach neuroanatomy to medical students. We pull brains out of formaldehyde buckets all the time. I got to get do this on Wednesday morning, and um, I can tell you, you can't tell whether it's a male brain or female brain. There's nothing about the structure that's different. Um, however, there are differences at the microscopic level, and these tend to be uh, on this, what we would call statistical, not categorical. None of the differences define male and female as differently as genitalia or chromosomes, for example. Innate factors like genes and hormones do bias certain behaviors, I, I'll talk about those, but 
ultimately, uh, the behaviors that we uh, are most acutely aware of, differences in school performance, differences in emotional uh, sensitivity, um, ultimately we can trace all of these to an important role for learning and practice. Practice. What you do with your brain is what it's good at. And you need to think about that starting when children are first born. So a quick little primer on brain development. Um, the brain develops through this blend of nature and nurture, of course, that's uh, before birth, when even, you know, subtle environmental influences can alter the developmental trajectory, what the mother's eating or, or chemicals she may be exposed to. Uh, but it's really the nurture side of this that um, we have any influence over. And in neuroscience, we've adopted this term plasticity, this lovely plastic that you can turn into milk jugs and playground equipment and grocery bags um, that ultimately explains how our brains learn anything, how we do anything beyond the most basic brainstem reflex, but like sucking and swallowing. Everything else we do, we thinking and talking and remembering, is learned through changes in, the, in brain structure called plasticity. And there's two little rules of cells that fire together, wire together. So if there's electrical activity in a circuit, uh, the, there's actual sprouting of the synapses and an increased connection between two neurons. And conversely, um, so conversely, there's this use it or lose it rule. So that if you don't activate a circuit, if you don't play a sport, if you don't speak a language, you actually prune away those synapses. So again, we need to think about that in terms of early uh, gender development. And most importantly, this plasticity is far, far more potent in the first few years of life um, than at any later time. So what about gender? Um, I tend to think of uh, growing up as a girl or growing up as a boy almost as being immersed in two different languages, the languages of gesture, the languages of play, the languages of clothes. Um, we, um, children figure out, boys and girls figure out, or babies figure out, the difference between male and female voices and faces. Even in the first year of life, they already have these categories so that once they know they're a boy and know they're a girl, they feel very fervent about exercising only certain activities. And unfortunately, what you do with your brain is what you're good at throughout life. And so these different styles of play both have tremendous advantages, but we need boys and girls to do both. We need boys and girls to both be nurturing and to play with moving objects. So I'm happy to say that's one thing the Roots of Empathy can do um, that uh, very few other programs can do um, uh, for boys. So um, with that said, I want to speak, of course, about the, the nature side. I'm not uh, by any, I'm a biologist. I'm not going to stand up here and pretend that genes and hormones don't have some influence. There's lots of animal research that tells us that um, gender differences, sex differences in behavior are shaped not so much directly by genes, but by the hormones that, that they then program. And most of the action happens in prenatal testosterone. So this just shows the way our hormones fluctuate across life. There's actually a surge of testosterone in boys before birth that is responsible for physical development, for turning the urogenital system in one direction as opposed to the other. And that also, we know, has some impact on behavior. And then there's this little spurt after birth of hormones that turns out has very little behavioral effect. And then we have the, the later phase we're all familiar with after puberty. Um, boys and girls' hormones rise again. Girls, women are cycling. Men have uh, elevated levels of testosterone. But it turns out lots and lots of research, which I have no time to go into, um, tells us that there's very little impact of this, these adult fluctuations in hormones um, on our thinking and our mood in spite of PMS and all that. Turns out it's a very trivial effect. Whereas the one thing that does seem to have an impact is this prenatal testosterone that's uh, much higher in boys than girls. And that has been linked to a few different um, aspects of behavior. It seems to bias this toy preference, the, the trucks versus the dolls. It probably sways one's sexual orientation to a degree uh, to be preferred uh, female partners. Um, it influences physical activity level, and it, pro it 
probably influences to a degree spatial skills. But I really want to emphasize this is all just a bias. It's just a little shift. It's not a switch that throws the brain in one direction or another. And we know that for many, many reasons. But I can tell you, for example, even with sexual orientation. So girls who are exposed to very high levels of testosterone before birth, uh, it's a disorder known as congenital adrenal hyperplasia, uh, show some shifting of their behavior in the masculine direction. They're also physically affected. But uh, when these girls are identified at birth, um, they're usually raised as girls and, um, and from there forward uh, identify as females. It does not, that high testosterone before birth does not actually shift their gender identity. It shifts their sexual orientation, but just a little bit. So most girls exposed to uh, prenatal testosterone grow up to be heterosexual females, although the proportion who are uh, bisexual or lesbian is, is larger than a control. So there are these, it's just a little shifting bias. It's not an all or none uh, decision making. And so we know from these girls with CAH, there's this hierarchy. Their gender identity, remarkably enough, is not altered at all. So gender identity seems to be most influenced by, by rearing, and the activities and their interests uh, somewhat less so. But interestingly, studies of the brain so far have not uh, shown any uh, specific changes um, in these girl women exposed to high testosterone before birth. There's nothing that, that magically seems to masculinize their brain. And that's because there really aren't such dramatic differences in the male-female brain. So let me then talk for a couple of minutes, uh, try to summarize thousands of studies um, on what we do know about sex differences in the brain. So the fact that there are psychological differences tells us there has to be some, something different. We don't think out of thin air, so there's got to be some sorts of differences in the brain. But the fact that these are relatively mo modest behavioral differences, in other words, you usually need many dozens of people or hundreds of people to see them, tells us that the brain differences are going to be rather small. And so in animals, we know it's confined largely to an area of the brain called the hypothalamus, these dots for testosterone receptors. Um, and that, of course, is what drives the whole reproductive axis. So yes, parts of our brain are different because they have to drive the pituitary and the, and the gonads. But the parts of our brain that are involved in thinking and feeling up here in the cortex are relatively little. And actually, some would argue that our brains are really more, more intersex than they are um, pink or blue. So here's what we know for sure. Uh, girls' brains are smaller and finish growing earlier. So if you look from birth to death, females have smaller brains than males, about 10, maybe 12 percent. And before you get too excited about that, um, the heart is larger in males, the kidney, the liver. So let's not talk about bigger is better, necessarily. I don't know if a better, bigger kidney is better. But, um, Anyway, um, males have larger brains throughout the lifespan, and also girls' brains finish growing earlier. So you see the brain grows, and then it goes into this pruning phase that I have no time to discuss, but um, suffice it to say that this pruning uh, begins earlier in girls, about one to two years earlier in all the lobes. And of course, that co coincides with physical puberty. Girls finish go through puberty about one to two years earlier, so they, they enter this adult uh, uh, phase. But beyond that, if we look at the structure of individual parts of the brain, the hippocampus, which is important for memory, the uh, amygdala, which is important for emotion recognition, there actually are no differences between males. These are hundreds of males and females structures. You see the dots are completely overlapping in this uh, large study of several hundred subjects. Here's, here's a myth. Uh, men tend to use one hemisphere at a time, and we women are multitaskers. We use both at, this, uh, at the same time. This is on a website, girlslearndifferently.com, that you're supposed to use this in the classroom, this information. But the truth of the matter is, no. We're all left hemisphere dominant. Most people are right-handed, and most people are left hemisphere dominant. Men, a little bit more so than women, if you see the blue curve, is. This is a, a 300 subjects. If women really used both hemispheres equally, then these curves, this curve would peak at zero. But instead, we're all shifted to the left. Um, and there's lots of other lines of evidence that support that. Again, meta-analyses, review articles, looking at all the data together. Um, both men and women are left hemisphere dominant. 
If we just look at resting connectivity, um, this is a new method, uh, this whole human connectome project that, that uh, Obama was, is uh, trying to fund, um, has begun and, and uh, people are looking at parts of the brain that are more highly connected than others. And so these pink areas are areas in um, this very large study, I think it was 1,400 subjects, that um, in this big group were statistically more connected in women. The blue areas are areas statistically more connected to other brain areas in men. But if you really look across the population of this 1,400 subjects, again, you see these curves that look much like the behavioral sex differences. They're quite small. These are statistical population level differences, but they're certainly not predictive uh, for any individual child or adult. And interestingly, exactly that same measure of connect of the connectome, there's no difference in adolescence. So, um, you know, this may be something that develops later in life. And there I want to get to a key point about sex differences in the brain. Just because you see a sex difference in the brain doesn't necessarily mean, and just because the brain is a biological organ doesn't necessarily mean it's a hardwired. That word hardwired is very dangerous in my book. When we say, I don't believe anybody's hardwired for anything except those brainstem sucking and swallowing reflexes. It really is de devoid of all hope to think that we're hardwired. Um, so here's a, just a little thought experiment for you. Consider two individuals, subject X and subject Y, are in the brain scanner, and they're asked to perform a task of a moral judgment, um, a hypothetical scenario, and asked to decide if, if they acted morally or immorally. And you see this very dramatic difference. Subject X has a strong activation of the medial prefrontal cortex. Subject Y, this little blip in the frontal pole. And of course, I'm misleading you to think that this is a, a woman and this is a man, when in fact, uh, these were just two individuals Ra uh, raised in different uh, faiths. So same, same gender in this case, but their upbringing altered the way their brains functioned in this moral reasoning task. And so I would argue that all of this gender learning is at least as potent as other cultural experiences in shaping the way the brain functions. And I'm happy to say I'm not the only one that has critiqued this large brain literature. Uh, there's a couple of other books that have come out recently that have done the same thing. So I really don't have time to go into all the evidence, but I'm going to flash some of it by you to, to uh, try to persuade you how, as much as we try to be gender neutral, it's pretty hard and children are getting a lot of lessons along the way that are fueling their gender uh, differences. And so uh, it comes from family, it comes from peers, from some of the culture, and we've proven, psychologists have proven influences on all of these aspects that we, in spite of these apparently gender neutral babies, what we really do when we interact with children is we think to the future and what we want them to be when they grow up. <laughs> so for example, this just came out recently in January in the New York Times as a researcher, I forget where he's at, MIT or something. Um, he just, uh, you can do this big data searches and figure out what people are querying Google for. And it turns out parents are two and a half times more likely to ask if their son is a genius than if their daughter is a genius. And they're two times more likely to ask if their daughter is fat than if their son is fat. So what do we care about as parents? We egalitarian, um, equal-minded parents, we care about having brilliant baby boys and beautiful baby girls. Um, so go to the toy aisles. We still have this gender-divided um, absolute segregation of uh, the warrior the warrior and building toys versus the pretty and pink anything. Um, why crayons have to have two genders, I don't know. Uh, I think a boy could draw with a, a crayon from this box, possibly. Um, and this is my favorite. <laughs> uh, if your daughter is interested in the planets, you can get her a telescope. Of course, it's got to be pink because this, she knows, is for boys. Too bad, though, it's only 90 power, whereas he gets the 525 power. <laughs> so just get her ready for that science career. <laughs> and um, uh, Peggy Ornstein pointed this out, that uh, when Legos first came along, they were a gender-neutral toy, this famous ad 
um, shows this little girl building this, this wonderful creation. And now, um, then, gen then like many things, Legos developed a gender. Everything has a gender, it turns out. Um, and Legos used to be gender neutral, but then came Bionicles and Star Wars. And, um, and they developed a gender, so girls stopped playing with them. And, and um, you know, so in order to encourage girls to play with Legos, Legos had to invent these girly Legos, this, these Lego friends, which have, um, of course, taller and skinnier figures, for one thing, <laughs> and um, these pre-built sets that were in um, characteristics that girls were thought to uh, appreciate. So um, we hit kids with these different clothes, these different toys. Um, it's pretty hard to avoid, and in some ways it's gotten worse, and I think we'll hear more about that shortly. But we parents, as gender biased as we, uh, as gender neutral as we think we are, turns out we're not. And so this was a study done at New York University that um, asked mothers to estimate uh, how steep of a slope your your 11 month old baby will crawl down. And it turns out mothers were much. Um, uh, less confident about their daughters. They tended to put the slope at a more shallow, and they cranked it up more steeply for their sons, <laughs> when in fact, the infants were equally capable of crawling down the slope. In fact, the girls were a little bit better. But there's actually no, lots and lots of uh, normalization. There's no sex differences in gross motor skills. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead to some other issues. Toy preference. Um, Boys and girls both like dolls in the first year of life because dolls have faces. And if we are programmed to like anything, it's so infants attend to the human face, which is who will feed them and who will take care of them. So boys and girls both spend more time looking at uh, dolls than balls in the first year, but then that changes with time. And uh, boys discover, um, boys get the message that they're supposed to stay away from pink things, and girls actually get more open-minded and will play more. The point is, uh, hopefully, um, that these sex differences are, are quite modest. Girls talk all of a month earlier than boys across the toddler years. And um, it's simply not true that, uh, that girls are hardwired for empathy and boys are not. So here's a study, a brain imaging study, again, meta-analysis. There was no gender difference in the way that our brains are activated in an experience of um, empathy. There's a lot of stuff about um, uh, implicit bias that I hope, if you're not already familiar with what implicit bias is, you go to the, the website. Um, implicit.harvard.edu, there's all these tests you can do to prove that no matter how uh, open-minded you think you are, whether it's gender, race, ageism, um, fat discrimination, we're all uh, biased and we should be aware and we should try to fight it, but um, it does impact the way that we interact with uh, kids. There definitely are uh, differences between boys and girls. I think they start out small, but a lot in our culture works to magnify these. So we have a choice as parents in a society. We can emphasize the differences or we can train, I, what I call cross-training, get boys and girls to interact more, to play more of the same sports and the same games and the same um, with, you know, nurturing activities um, to try to counteract some of what our culture is driving them apart. And we've been doing this for girls. The proof is here. Girls have made tremendous progress in sports, in science, technology, engineering, math careers, and in leadership. Although we have a long, we have further to go. Um, but um, boys have not been afforded that same opportunity. It's hard to get boys to sign up for art classes and chorus and, and a lot of things they used to do now. Um, and because the definition of, of what's appropriately masculine seems to be shrinking, and I think we'll hear more about that from some of the other speakers. So I believe that learning and this tremendous plasticity of the human brain can overcome the stereotypes and norms, but only if we start early and keep an open mind about our children. So thanks very much. I look forward to your questions. <laughs>